Hello, everybody, and welcome. It's so lovely to see so many faces in the room. My goodness, I'm starting to get nervous now. <laughs> welcome, welcome, everybody. This is the Global Mental Health Peer Network webinar, and we are chatting today about birth trauma. We just want to welcome you into the space. Uh, we invite you to please participate as we continue. We are gathered here with some amazing representatives, global representatives, who will be sharing their lived experience with us. Um, and obviously part of that is to just be compassionate and hold space for them as they do so, but we would love to have your engagement as well. The reason that we're doing this is we're just off bereaved of you know bereaved family month that was last month and birth trauma itself is a global phenomenon that's affecting about 15 percent of people and their extended families and today we're going to be focusing on the postpartum element so postpartum and the treatment and the care and the emotions and the feelings and how it impacts mental health and the postpartum period is really the first six weeks um, after the birth or loss of a child after pregnancy. So thank you. I am welcomed and joined today as well by our, by our team of amazing lived experience speakers. Um, Jana from Indonesia, Letitia from South Africa, Lorette from South Africa, Tanya from South Africa, and Simon from Uganda. So in advance, thank you all for joining us and for sharing light on this very, very important topic. Um, to begin, I think we'd like to invite our speakers to just tell us a little bit about their lived experience in this space and everything that came with it. So we'd like to start perhaps with Letitia. Welcome, Letitia. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Letitia, as Kirshni has very kindly introduced me. Um, I'd like to share my experience of being a mother and dealing with the postpartum period of, of my life. But before I start there, I want to share with you what I've been part of in, in the beginning phases. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm also a mother, and I try to be part of impact-focused businesses. So much like um, Elsa, which is something that Keshni has been a part of, and Everbrave, which is my brand that I would love to um, share with you. It's all about being the best version, uh, best version of yourself. And that is for mental health and wellness and to take you from the transformations of all of the troubles that you go through to the transformation of being you. So on my journey of motherhood, um, it was one of those things that you kind of step into saying, yeah, I'm prepared and I'm going to do this and I'm going to overcome all of the challenges, but it hits you, it hits you like a brick wall. I had to do a lot of the introspection in that space just after I had my son and each pregnancy was so different. So when I talk about my kids, I've got three. And I started off with my son, Levi. He was um, my first transformation into this journey of being a, mom, a mother and being in the birthing space. But in the postpartum space, I felt like I didn't get the support that I needed. And it was harder for me to reach out to people because I didn't know what I needed at that point. And knowing, not knowing what I needed meant that I was just going through the phases of you come out of hospital and you have this bundle of joy with you, but there's so many changes. Your body is changing. Your hormones are changing. Your, your entire space is different. The way that you went out to go and have your baby, to come back, it, it's different. It's not the same. You actually view life so much more differently from a different lens. And that is this responsibility of looking after a newborn baby, um, one that is going to be with you for the rest of your life. And as I transitioned and as I went through those journeys of my body changing and I felt uh, a bit of depression, along with a lot of anxiety, I had to find ways to calm myself in order to see to my baby. Because the moment I would get 
emotional, my child would get emotional and then I would have to find the methods and the music and things that aligned with me to help me balance out the, the transition. So yeah, I was afraid of being judged. I didn't want to be judged because I felt like being an Indian woman and being a mom, you know, you need to know it all. Your mom has always told you about all of the things that you need to do and how you need to look after your baby. And it was, I did know some of the things, but a lot of the things, it was almost like my, my family didn't respect the boundaries that I would want to put in. And that respect caused a whole ripple effect in my space with my family because now I had to kind of step back and say you know this is my baby I want to raise him in a specific way and in doing so that led me to having more depression and being alone very alone so on that journey I started reaching out to other women and finding out what they're doing and realize that they are actually going through the same thing and they feel alone. They don't know exactly know what to do. And we started speaking about these things. So what I felt that I wanted to share with you is that it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to not know all the answers because there's somebody else on their journey that will come your way that is going through that. And you'll learn or you'll figure out how to connect, but the universe is aligned that way where it will bring you together. So keep on being brave. These are challenges, but they are something that you'll overcome and it'll make you a better person and make you feel more whole. <laughs> so yeah, that's my, my journey. Um, there's so much more to say about it. Five minutes doesn't do much uh, in terms of the amount that I can share in the space. But yeah, that's just the, the little piece of it that I can give. <laughs> Letitia, thank you. It, it might be little, but it is profound on so many levels. And I think what you mention is, is so authentic and beautiful and vulnerable and at the same time so strong. You touch on judgment, you touch on culture, you, judge, you touch on loneliness, despite being surrounded by people. Uh, you touch on bravery, just keep going, you know, and how you had to make sure that you are okay to look after your kids and these are all valid and i believe you and we all do and thank you so much for sharing yeah. thank you i'm sure many people here resonate thank you Kashmir. you're welcome thank you again and please do please do if you resonate with any of our speakers let us know by using the reaction tabs and in chat, just to give them a little bit of inspiration. Oh, no, Every so now and then, it would be great. So thank you, Letitia. We'll have a chance to chat to Letitia a little bit more uh, later, but we're gonna move on to one of our other speakers now, Yana. So Yana, are you here? Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. Yeah, okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Yana from Indonesia. I'm a mother of uh, three children and I am a postpartum doula also. Um, my uh, story uh, with uh, birth trauma is begin uh, one day at uh, 27 weeks of gestation for a pregnancy checkup. A uh, routine procedure was carried out by my OBGYN, uh, but suddenly uh, my doctor uh, face turned pale and very uh, fear, intense of fear. And I, I asked my doctor what's wrong, and uh, she said that I'm very sorry because I could not find your baby's heartbeat. So um, my baby has died in my home at 70, uh, 27 weeks of gestation, And I very sad and I tried to check to the another hospital and uh, my doctor and also nurses tried to holding my hands because I cannot believe that my baby uh, is passed away. 
and the word seems very collapsed. My legs cannot span, and my sight suddenly blurry, and my chest is too tight. Yeah, I also have a panic attack after that, and also uh, a nurse took me in a wheelchair to the to one room or delivery room, and uh, what make me surprised and what make me sad is the nurse is was blame me and uh, she said that uh, how could the baby die uh, she said like that and uh, it's like it is my fault why uh, my baby is uh, born to still birth and I just only can be silent and cry at the time and my head was very dizzy and I start to feel instant hot brown, hot hot brown. And then next to my room, there is a delivery room. Uh, there was the sound of the babies and also the joyful uh, of waiting family members. Meanwhile, um, my baby is very silent. Um, he, uh, my baby was, uh, he, he, my, first, my first son, and she born uh, silently and uh, it also impact my second pregnancy because when uh, i had my second pregnancy the uh, the trauma is still instant i felt like a, a flashback also the nightmare or a feeling uh, how if my uh, second pregnancy is failure again and also um, affect my uh, mental health as a new mother. After my uh, second baby is uh, born, we call it as a um, rainbow baby. Yeah. When we have another live baby, so we call it as a newborn baby. Uh, I have a difficulty uh, to bonding with my baby and also I have a difficulty to breastfeeding uh, my newborn baby and I don't have any bonding with her. Maybe uh, you will feel asking me uh, finally after having a healthy baby after waiting for four years after a uh, marriage and then finally I have a healthy and very a perfect baby in my arm, in my eyes. But why do you feel sad? Then I later uh, go to the psychiatrist and clinical psychologist. I was uh, diagnosed uh, with uh, postpartum depression and also uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, but trauma, PTSD. So my main uh, diagnosis is post-traumatic uh, stress disorder from uh, my first pregnancy. And also, uh, I think uh, by my story, then I uh, founded an organization to provide support for a mother with postpartum depression and also uh, anxiety and PTSD. Um, and after I um, recovery from PTSD and postpartum uh, PTSD and uh, postpartum depression, um, I think and uh, I still uh, support every mother uh, who have um, experience like me. And I think it's not only about about trauma at the moment, but also. Uh, the blood trauma that women have in postpartum period can impact longer. It's not only about at the time, but also can impact how do you bond with your baby and how you uh, breastfeeding, how you make uh, parenting like that, and how you see yourself. And also, uh, I think it is very important to support every mothers who have blood trauma uh, in every situation, uh, not only about miscarriage or stillbirth, but also uh, in the birth trauma, uh, for example, from the difficulty um, delivery 
and also uh, maybe from uh, eclampsia, preeclampsia, or maybe you have another experience like your baby in uh, an ICU or need you in a very long time. So it's not a very, it is not a good experience, but uh, we need to know that uh, every woman in this world may uh, experience birth trauma or uh, maybe PTSD and it can affect uh, how they uh, see their self, how they perceive their self as a mother. Uh, so uh, it's not only about the experience also, but how the uh, midwife, how the health worker can make the experience easier and uh, the midwife or also the health worker can make the experience uh, worse or worsen the experience because of the because the behavior like my uh, my experience like the nurses or the midwife put blame on me it is not a very good experience for mother so when the mother is grieving uh, with the baby when the baby is gone it is very uh, difficult to the mothers. So I think uh, the midwife also uh, should have uh, supportive, supportive uh, behavior towards the mother. So um, it is estimated that 20 until 25 pregnancy uh, and in miscarriage or stillbirth. So in addition to grief, many of these women also experience postpartum depression or anxiety and giving birth to premature child or having a child uh, extended time in neonatal intensive care unit can also take a toll on maternal mental health. So it's not only about a healthy baby, it's not only about the uh, the perfect baby, but you you need to, uh, we need to ask how is the mother condition, how's the mother feeling? Is the, uh, is the experience of delivery or pregnancy is uh, good or bad for her, we need to ask because it's not only about a short uh, experience, not only about short moment, but also in, it can impact our aspect as a mother, how we uh, breastfeeding our baby and how we parent our baby and how we bond our baby. So everyone needs to notice about the birth trauma or uh, PTSD that a woman can have in this work. Thank you. Thank uh, you, thank you so much, Yana. Thank, thank, you. thank you for sharing not just your experience, but your baby as well. I know it's very, very close to my heart. And from all across the world, you know, I, I resonate deeply with you. And it was so powerful, Yana, when you, when you said my legs fell under me. It's so amazingly descriptive of what that feels like, you know, having lived it myself. But I love the concepts that you raised about the blame shame that could yeah. come in, you know, about how long this process does take, about the impact that it has on other children and other pregnancies. Yeah. Um, your, your, your journey is an inspiring one. And the biggest thing is, you know, born still is still a child born, right? Yeah. Um, and that's very powerful. So I so appreciate you bringing this to us and trusting us with your experience. Thank you, Yana. Thank, Thank you. you. And we will come back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone who's ever joined us. Um, we're about ready to get to our third speaker now. And that third speaker is Lorette. And Lorette is from South Africa. She's based with us. So Lorette, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Welcome, Lorette. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about, just a little bit about who I am. I am a birth doula. I have been a birth doula for 15 years. I am a bereavement doula and just recently became a um, wellness counsellor. And I came into this environment because um, I gave birth to my children very young. And in that, um, I didn't have support. And then my youngest, my eldest daughter also had her children young. And in that environment, I saw a midwife and a doula. 
And then I saw this is how women should be treated. They should not be left alone. They should always have support. And so I then started on my journey and my journey on becoming a doula. I'm just going to read something. And it's by Inamay Gaskin, who is a very popular midwife. When a child is born, the entire universe has to shift and make room. That is Inamay May Gaskin. An unknown, somebody who wrote this, said, the moment a child is born, the mother is two, each and every time. And for me, that's really what it's about as a doula and as a postpartum doula is that each and every mom come with a new story with each and every baby. I mean, four out of five um, women will have some postpartum blues. And, and this is in my observation. One out of five will have depression. So the whole family struggles, you know, labor, However it goes is trauma. And the mind and body soul goes through so much. And then the mother thinks that she must just be normal. Now I must be normal. I've just had a baby. And society thinks, she thinks society thinks she must be normal and just get up and be a mother. But that takes a whole new way of living and a whole new way of being. So it is important for us to know as caregivers or caregivers and people that want to be in the environment of a mother, that she needs to be heard. That support is totally, totally important. Families struggle, you know, my observation is they struggle so much when a baby comes. It doesn't matter if it's baby number one, baby number two, baby number three. There's uh, sleep deprivation, you know, anxiety comes in. Um, unexpected financial uh, spendings. Then family and family and friends at visits and you know the mother must uh, be in that environment as a because it's family and she must be in that environment. And so she doesn't know how to say no and she gets depleted more and more. And even divorce is spoken about now. I've, I've really realized over the last year or two how much divorce and separation is spoken about because they just don't know, families just don't know how to handle this anymore on their own. Too often we underestimate the power of a touch, a smile, a kind word, and listening, just listening. We don't have to tell the family what to do, but we can listen and then advise. The smallest act of caring has a potential to turn a life and family around. Support has become, for me as a doula, really important pre and post and on Labor Day, just support. So in this uh, whole journey, it's for me, it has been that we have lost, we have lost it, you know, the community needs to get it back. We need to know mothers are having a hard time and they won't just speak about it because they are mothers and they need to be brave and strong and courageous. But if we just help them gently to know that support is available. Because when the mother matters and she feels mattered and heard, the whole family will do better on a whole. So for me, that's the most powerful um, journey I'm on now is just to really know and let community need to come back. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lorette. You add you're such a calming. I can just picture you in a birth. It's like so amazingly calm, just your voice and the way that you are and 15 years worth. So thank you for bringing that to the space. And I think what's so important is that race to normalization that you mentioned that could really cause women and families to almost suffer in silence. Um, the stats that you mentioned, it's more common than we think, you know, from a mental health perspective, and yet we don't talk out about it uh, for fear of these happy uh, occasions being viewed as not so happy. And I absolutely love when you were talking about the real price 
of pregnancy and birth, the emotional, the spiritual, just that whole wellness realm. Um, and what we should be talking more about and normalizing so that more voices can come to the fore. Of course, as a granny and as a, as a mom, you add that layer too. So thank you so much for your time. I <laughs> really appreciate it. Thank you. And I can see some comments for you there in the comments as well. We're moving on now. Um, gosh, I'm just in awe of all our speakers so far. And I'm going to open the space now for Tanya, who's going to speak to us. And Tanya is also from South Africa. So Tanya, when you're ready. Hi, everyone. It's lovely to be here with you all today. So yeah, my experience, I'm, I'm a registered counselor. I'm, I'm a mom of three, and I'm also the sole provider in my home. So I'm a home provider. I'm a counselor and a mommy of three, all different age groups. And each pregnancy came with each different trauma. And the only thing that was the same in each pregnancy, there was also a loss between pregnancies of twins. And the one thing that remained the same with each pregnancy was a diagnosis of postnatal and the medication. And the lack of, although you feel there's so many people around you, you still feel so isolated and alone. And you feel like you become this person that is in charge of taking care of this little human being and the accountability and responsibility is purely on you to the point that with each one of them I was dealing with severe anxiety and depression as well as the postnatal part of it that I wanted to protect my children so much that I isolated myself from everyone so I wouldn't allow anyone near my children I became germophobic I made excuses not to see family. I didn't allow family to come see my babies. And I know that the one thing I do recall is that when people see a baby, even my close family, they always grab the little baby's hands. And that used to traumatize me to such a degree that I used to actually physically in front of them, wipe my, my little one's hands. Even though with each pregnancy and each birth, something different triggered it off every time, I still dealt with it three times. And um, that you often have that saying where you just find yourself feeling so alone. And even if you've got someone like your mom with you, you know, I often used to get this, but gosh, I had you so many years ago. How would I remember all these things? And I remember with my second, with my second one, I, my body, I felt like my body had failed me because I almost lost her at a week old. She choked my breast milk. And my mother-in-law was there. And I recall her holding this baby up and this baby was blue and stiff. And I recall her trying to get life into this little one. And I felt like something I was born to do to breastfeed my baby, I had actually almost killed my baby. And then the third pregnancy came as a complete surprise to me. And I had said, you know what, this pregnancy I'm going to be calmer with, only to lose my mom, who was my world, my everything. And I think the one thing I did also learn and with my experiences from going through all this is I come from a mixed racial marriage and the cultural dynamics in the marriage were very different. It was almost like, put yourself together. You've got this baby to take care of, just do what you need to do. And we didn't discuss the emotions and feelings about it. And I think now looking back and being older, I think that it would have just been so nice just to have that one person that would have said to me, I hear you and see you. And I hear what you're saying. And I think that would have made such a difference to me. I think being feeling alone and feeling like I was the only one going through all this when there's so many women that go through this and you hear the stories afterwards. I think at that point, if I had just had that one person, it would have made a huge difference to the way I was feeling. And I often see those pictures on Facebook where you see the mom sitting in the bathroom crying while she's holding her head and she's got nothing on her and she's got this different body, even an alien to her own body and form because that happened to me. I picked up so much weight in all three pregnancies. And um, I, was, I often get that picture of how I used to sit in the bathroom with this big tummy and the cesarean cut and the tears streaming down my face because it just felt so isolated and so alone. So I think just us saying to women out there, we hear we, we see you and it's a normal thing we go through, but we should be there to, to be there for each other as women, as just in, even our families, we should have that, I'm here for you, let's, let's get through this. That's a little bit, I can tell you so much more and how many more mental impacts it had on me after. And yes, there are those joy moments, but there's also a lot of those impactful anxiety and stressful moments that I did experience as a mom and in all three different times and different years. I mean, my one's 20, my one's 10 and my one is six. So the years in between were 
quite different and with each one was that same experience of just feeling alone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. My goodness, what a beautiful, open and vulnerable, strong, full share. So appreciate you. And you mentioned such amazing things, but the thing that sticks in my mind is that visual of that mother sitting in that shower um, alone. You know, again, we hear the word, we hear loneliness. We hear, I did have people around me, but maybe they weren't doing the things for me. We hear the value of shared stories. And like Alexandra mentions there in the comments, we hear you and we see you. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Just, and thank you for inspiring and being there for other people so that they too can hear their own voices. Um, and then you also bring up the, the mixed cultures and the dynamics that that could, you know, could cause the expectation and also the intergenerational having those babies at different parts and still the expectation balls. So lots of learning moments and sharing moments. Thank you so much for sharing, Tanya. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, everybody. So thank you so much so far. And we now have uh, Simon, all the way from Uganda, who's going to add his perspective to the conversation today. So Simon, welcome. And please share with us. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Simon Ndaula. I'm a clinical psychologist and I've been working on trauma for past 17 years, but uh, with respect to what we're discussing now, it's about six years. With a, there's a charity called Vessel Is Me in Uganda that helps uh, couples navigate infertility and maternal loss. And my role, how did I come on board? I came on board because as the mothers were being helped to grieve, there was a question of their husband. So what happens? Where, where are they in all this? And I recall my first engagement was an event called Night at the Round Table, where men who were going, who were, who had gone through these challenges had a chance to speak. And I had them out. Their wives did the catering and we sat somewhere far away. And we started to speak about these things. And so what, what, what is my role currently? My role is like a translator or a person who is trying to help. Aside from helping people navigate the, the trauma and all, but it's translate, you say. So I explained to the wives that um, depending on when you lost the child, you might or might not get a response from your partner. Like if it's a miscarriage, Men cannot connect with it because we don't carry children, sadly. So if it's a two weeks, two weeks miscarriage, for instance, um, a man cannot relate to it, you know? Uh, but if it's a stillbirth, you might see some emotion from it. And one of the complaints was, you know, uh, just like the previous speaker said she felt alone, most of the women are like, you know, I'm struggling alone in this. Where is he <clears throat> in this? And, and they come from the place where the men tell them maybe after a certain time, you should move on, you know? And I was telling them that, you know, we are, no one is at fault here. All of us look at the world through a masculine or feminine lens in terms of coping with situations. And men typically don't have a language when it comes to suffering. We have one word things, you know, whenever, Something happens to us, we say be strong or things like that. So we're not as expressive as women because women always seek connection in anything. Any small thing, women want to be hard. Women want to let it out. We're not like that. So I was trying to explain to them that it's not that they are not experiencing anything because you are not hearing them express themselves like you do, okay? But you need to learn that they also have ways of experiencing trauma or depression, you know? And of course the challenge is how can I support them, you know? And women want to talk. They want to hear you talk. They want to 
They want you to be vulnerable. These are women's words. And I was telling those that lexicon is not is not part of our world. You know, being vulnerable is is contrary to how we are raised. We are raised to be tough, to be there. You know, so so it's been a very interesting journey, and um, we are still trying to hack. You know how to support men. Okay, with respect to this, uh, fortunately. We have an uh, inroad, men who come uh, for individual sessions or group sessions, we do have positive movement in terms of them understanding and navigating the laws. But we've, we're have also trying to use professionals because men, men work with information, you know. Professionals who are specialized in the fields of infertility and maybe also the, the guides because you know doctors don't say much <laughs> to couples. You know, I think I've had this from 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 this space. I'm, I'm not surprised. It looks like a universal thing. So we're trying to encourage them to engage men more with respect to supporting women along the length of the pregnancy. And that's when we believe that men might play a supportive role throughout the pregnancy and even when the outcomes are not <clears throat> desirable, they are bound to be more supportive throughout the pregnancy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for, for adding your voice. I think just even symbolically, <laughs> you being here and talking about this creates waves, you know? Um, and so I appreciate that. And I mean, just some gems, Simon, language of suffering. I think that's so powerful, like just, you know, the expectation, how it is received, the role of the translator acknowledgement, you and I understand things differently. Maybe we need a translator to come in here to make sure that this is, you know, okay. And then the hacking the hacking, you know, we're still working towards that. But I think what's most significant is that they are trying, everybody's playing a role in trying to be supportive in the space. Um, all of the voices that we've heard today spoke to that. We're trying, we're feeling, we're emoting, and obviously the work that you're doing is supporting that. So thank you very much for, for your feedback and for your perspective on this, truly appreciate it. So to all our speakers, you've all been amazing. And I was wondering if we could maybe open up the floor for some questions, for some Q&A um, from anyone who is wanting to ask a question um, to the panel or to a specific speaker. Feel free to either type it out in chat or you can um, send it through if you would like to remain anonymous. That's completely fine too. You can send it through to myself, Claudia, Sandra, or Zach. Um, so feel free to do that as well. So we'll just maybe give a minute just to hear if anyone has any questions. Oh, Zach says, put your hand up. That's even better. Thank you, Zach. <laughs> Zach is hacking the system. Very good. <laughs> so you can just raise your hand. If you don't know where that is, it's under the reaction tab and it looks like this. Claudia, I see your hand up. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, I actually, so I've got no experience in this um, setup at all. And, but I, I'm, you know, having heard these stories, I'm really touched by the experiences. Um, I would like to ask Simon, because we're still talking a lot about men's mental health in the agenda, you know, globally. And so, um, so if I can ask you, the fact that men, aren't as expressive and as open, how do you, in, 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 men in this situation, in this birth trauma um, experience, how do you then um, cope? Like what would be, what would be something you could suggest maybe to others watching? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear the last part of the question. There was a bit of an interruption. You saying, go on. No problem. Um, 
just thoughts um if you could share with us you know what could a man do in this type of situation um given they're not as emotive and not as open um and then maybe just something like a piece of advice to someone going through this what could they do as a man um because this is something that the peer network also really wants to work on is men's mental health. All right, uh, thank you very much. Very good question. I think uh, when, when a man's been told, I'm pregnant, okay, that's where it should start, right? They should strive to get as much information about this pregnancy thing as they can. Two, they should make as much effort as they can to go for the antenatal <clears throat> visit with a woman and ask questions okay they shouldn't be afraid to ask about what can go wrong here okay everything dietary and all that they need to learn if there are complications along the way let them ask the professionals questions now of course that might not happen but people like you who are in this space should make it like part of your advocacy okay for men to do this. Men operate very well when they are well armed with information. Okay. And they can play a supportive role, a very good supportive role based on that information. So the information will negate us posturing with our, uh, uh, with our social construct or nothing. We, we will be based, basing all our interactions on the information, okay? Um, that's where you have the man encouraging the woman to do certain things. If she, she feels challenged, you say, you know what? Do this, this is the outcome, you know? We were at the doctor, the doctor says, when we do this, we get this outcome. So I believe that's, that's how men can be of help. And that's where women will, will they will, will, will stop to feel alone. You know, they might recognize that effort in as much as they may want more, but at least they'll recognize that effort. Right. And then most important before I wind up, you know, we men have a short term memory when it comes to these things. You women who remember every little thing, right? So if the first pregnancy was okay, even though challenging, the next one will be okay because you know, Someone's there, no matter what. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and also, um, I think when, like you've said, um, the more you can also be supportive as the partner, you then get empowered yourself as well. So it's, it's, it works both ways. Um, thank you. That was really enlightening. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Simon. I think ask, be involved, stay connected three little steps <laughs> um, from what you said, but yeah, absolutely. Just the presence itself. And like Claudia said, just the energy exchange would be very valuable. Um, I saw Denise's hand up. So I wanna go to Denise. She did have a question. I'm not sure if she's still here. Hi, um, I'm still Hi. here, but I'm in such a no noisy place. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. We can now. Yes, Denise, please go ahead. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you so much for putting this together. Um, and thank you for to all the speakers. And, uh, I think she, uh, Bath Dula, I don't know who talked about the other expenses to pregnancy. Denise, I think we lost you, uh, but I heard you mention Lorette. And yes, I think Lorette. Yes. Yeah. So um, there's, I want to thank her for mentioning uh, the cost of um, this trauma on, my, on couples, on the marriage itself, and how the conversation now is leaning towards divorce and separation because most couples are not given the tools to deal with the loss or the trauma and that's causing them to separate 
um, I was wondering if there's any tool that she has which she could share with us when she's dealing with the birth mother. Thank you, Denise. Thank you so much. And coincidentally, Lorette does have, have her hand up. So <laughs> Lorette, if you could please, Denise is asking about couples and the cost, you know, the cost of, of um, a birth uh, psychologically, mentally, and do you have any advice in terms of the couple aspect of maternity care? Well, thank you, Denise. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to just also just go back to Simon, if, we, if it's okay, just to say you are so right, you know, in, in this whole situation, I always tell the dads, you are the lawyer, you are the foundation, and if you're around and you are there, the mother does so much better, and then the, the, the father feels important because he is the lawyer and he is the foundation, so thank you for saying that, it really is important. You're welcome, Lorette, thank you. Oh, um, Denise, thank you very much. Yes, I really have found that this has come up a lot, in the, especially in this last year, where I, I contact the mother on day, day one, how are you doing? And then day three, how are you doing? And then day seven, how are you doing? And then they will start to tell me they're not doing so great. The father and I are not doing well. And really, um, can you come out and speak to us? And the father always said, I don't need to speak, I'm fine. She's not fine. <laughs> and actually, um, then it is important for me to take them separately and listen to them and see exactly what, what is really going on here, what is breaking this foundation down. And many things will come up. One is really financial. They are struggling and they didn't expect the new costs that arise. And then we'll speak about that. Uh, but the other thing, mostly, it's about family interference. You know, family that interferes and they don't know how to how to stop that or they don't know how to navigate through that. And again, it's about finding what works for both of them as a couple, not just one or the other. And in my environment, uh, obviously, I work with a midwife or I work with uh, another doula, and we can help this family really speak it out and be listened to. And most of the times they find their own solution. When they see, when they hear they have been listened to, they will find their own solution when somebody's not telling them what to do. I don't know if that helps you, Denise. Denise, you might be muted if you're trying to answer Lorette back. Thank you, Lorette, for your inputs and for answering the question at hand. We'll wait for Denise to confirm if she's still here with us. Um, Sandra, I saw your hand up next. Thanks, Keshni. Um, firstly, thank you to uh, all the presenters today. It's really uh, wonderful. And I know it's it's quite daunting sometimes to share your lived experience and, uh, you know, just to be on, on this sort of platform and doing so. I really um, applaud you all and I really do thank you for your time. Um, to kind of build on that, I know that for you to be here today and express your lived experience and all the emotions and tribulations that you went through in your in your different capacities or very similar capacities at the same time, um, it shows that there is an amount of healing that that has already been done as individuals and within your your family. So I kind of have a um, a question to to the panel. Anyone can can answer it. Whoever's comfortable enough. But um, what words of inspiration would you give someone who's going through similar difficulties that that you had? Um, you know, I also have a friend at the moment who who is struggling with postpartum, um, and it would be nice for me to to relay some words from a first hand experience, from a lived from a, li a lived experience point of view. So yeah, that just. Uh, open to the floor anyone who's who's happy to give some input there please and thank you thank you so much Sandra who would like to give some input panel but to show you uh, I'll, 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 I'll go up <laughs> um I, I think it's it's a lovely topic and it's also very interesting because when you give birth to a child the thing that that happens is your 
whole environment changes, right? Not only the mom and the baby, but also the husband. So the foundation of your marriage is revamped. And a lot of the things that have just been kind of put under the carpet starts coming out. And that is the, that's the transformation that kind of has to be dealt because it's all of the things that you've ducked behind for years. And now when you have this child then these things just come out because now you're seeing things from a different light. You're both seeing things that are coming up and it's a lot of the fears um, of the past or the fears of the unconscious um, behaviors that you may have. And then when those things start surfacing, I think that's when the turmoil happens especially with all of the changes that have transpired with a, a newborn baby, because it's never constant with a newborn or even a six month old or nine month old. Their changes are so quick that just as you feel like you're getting the foundation, it changes again. And then there's more uh, little things that pop up along the way that allow for the marriage to kind of be shaken up because now it, it tests the foundation and it tests the beliefs and it tests the communication that the partners have and to share with um, Sandra the the words that I can share is that if you can create a safe space with each other to say that I'm not judging you by saying this but I'm sharing with you because you're my best friend and as my best friend you're going to give me the best advice but I'm not going to take it to heart and I'm not going to hide it away because you're the person that sees me as the most vulnerable person can be and when I take away the shield and I say that I'm open and it's okay then you can share that um, that space and and you can uncover the things that have really been um, pulling you apart because the child will come in to bring out those flaws that you need to work on to have a stronger relationship, to have a stronger marriage, to have a stronger bond. And when you create that safe space to allow each other to see each other just as a white blank canvas with no judgment, because both parties are scared of being judged. The mom is scared of being judged because of her experience and her body changing and the hormones. And the husband is scared of being judged because of all of his um his things that he's grown up and seen a woman do or his mom behave or his dad behave. So there's this judgment within the same space. And if you can take that judgment away and just say that you trust each other, I think that's the best thing that you can do for one another in that environment. So that's what I, I can say in that regard um, to give some encouragement. Thank you, Leticia. Thank you so much. Sandra, I will also give you a little word. But first, we'll see Lorette, because her hand's up. So, Lorette, would you like to also lean in here? Sure. So, a newborn is like the beginning of all things beautiful. But it can also be all things tougher than expected. And we only really know that when the baby's born. All the things that were there before are now going to come up and be elevated to a hundred and more. So the best advice I can give is, the purpose is to let the new mother and family know that support is available and can be arranged. They don't have to do it all on their own. This new journey does not have to be hard and alone. And when families know that, when they know that that is in there, they do so much better. But yes, it's first going to feel like a storm before calm comes. Thank you, Lorette. Thank you. Sandra, from my side, for your friend, you know, I studied it postgraduate. I lived it as a practitioner for many years, but I didn't truly really know it until I lived it, you know, until I lived my pregnancies and until I lived the loss of my son. So I would say, it's okay to grieve and celebrate the same journey. It's okay to find a friend and throw a pity party and a venting party. And it's okay to cry in the shower and laugh when, with your baby. Like that is honestly what I would say, because it is, as we can hear, it's, it's a combination of joy and something else and transition and, growing pains and confusion and 
pupa stage of development, you know? So that's what I would, I would say. Um, Tanya, is there anything you'd like to, to add as well? And then Jana also, just as we are closing to Sandra's friends. I think, I think most importantly is that saying that's so true, it's okay not to be okay. We don't have to be okay like all the time as new moms. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to have those moments where we feel we have to put on an upper front to make the people around us feel like we're doing this great job because it's okay not to be okay. And I think we should be able to voice that and be open in our relationships with our partners and the people around us and say to them, I'm not okay and open up that door for allowing those emotions and feelings to come out and create conversation around them so that the insight is there both to how the family and the partners and everyone is feeling. My mom always used to say something very important to me and that was, you must remember before baby came, you and him were there. It was first you two. Go back to it being you two and open up and talk to each other like you used to do before the baby came. So that would be my little bit of advice. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. And I say Sandra's friend, but because like we're all probably asking that question, like Sandra, I'm using it as a way for us to also <laughs> kind of get feedback here. It's such a great question. Simon, I see your hands up and then I'll come to Yana. All right. Okay, um, I, I, I just wanted to build on what Tanya said. And again, this is from experience um, with the couples. Um, I always... Uh, Tell them, please do not use this situation to score, to settle old scores. Okay. The woman, I tell them, and the woman at this point is the way she is because of biological changes. She's not being stubborn. She's not being, you know, big headed. She's not being, you know, and I usually give them the, the example of when things don't work out, how do you get home? You know, and you're telling people, don't get near me. So it's something similar. But there's a temptation to pick that moment to start fight. Yeah. So just work towards focusing on the bath experience or the challenges of the bath. That is what needs to be navigated. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. I love that analogy. Thank you so much for that. That's really powerful. Jana, I, I saw you unmute and then mute, so please yeah. let us know. Thank you, uh, Kashti. I think uh, either losing a baby or losing uh, an experience that you expected before until you have a bertoma is the most devastating experience. Yeah. Someone, especially mother and father, can go through. And also the bertoma even more uh, distressing because it comes at a time uh, when people are looking forward to a new life as a baby, as uh, having a baby. And for many parents, a baby's birth is a positive and inspiring experience. However, some parents find it traumatic even if the baby is healthy and well. And going through a birth involves momentous psychological and a change in a rapid uh, time of frame moments and but trauma can involve uh, physical trauma such as pelvic floor injury or it can be psychological and even more it is very difficult to uh, someone to see how uh, the mother is suffering from birth trauma because we cannot see uh, physically like uh, maybe uh, you have a postpartum hemorrhage because it is a mental health and not everyone is educated and so we have uh, to concern about the mother mental health and uh, but trauma is a very subjective meaning and it does, doesn't have to be life-threatening or medical traumatic to have a psychological impact and also it just experienced to be a traumatic by the woman and afterwards even uh, when your baby is well uh, those feeling doesn't always go away or disappear and also fathers and partners can develop uh, also PTSD and also a birth trauma as a result of witnessing a traumatic birth of his wife and also they need a help too. And uh, I think in my opinion, uh, the mother, also the father is in a vulnerable moment. So uh, the, the support is really uh, needed even though 
if you only ask how, how is your feeling, how are you, and also uh, give a space to uh, grieving. I think grieving is not only about losing your baby, but also losing your hope, losing your uh, your expected experience as a mother, uh, as a new mother, even though your baby is healthy and well. And also, uh, please give a practical uh, support and also like a, a provide uh, provide the best nutrition and also uh, encourage them to take rest, encourage them to uh, acknowledge their feeling and also encourage them to seek for help, for professional help like the psychologist or a psychiatrist, encourage them to have a very uh, important uh, therapy for a uh, trauma and also PTSD. So uh, I think the, the couple can recover and also can uh, decide first uh, either they want to have another baby or not. I think uh, many couples think that if we have another baby or we have another pregnancy, it can heal our birth trauma, but that is not it's not right. So the, the thing is not about having a baby, but also uh, how to recover or how you heal from your uh, past experience of birth trauma. And I'm very happy to see Simon here and also another uh, speakers who have uh, give me a, a very wonderful story and very wonderful insights. And I really agree that my husband also developed uh, anxiety after we lose our baby. So I think it is important that uh, also the father need a help to like mother does. Thank you, Kesni. Thank you so much, Yana. Thank you so much for that powerful words. Okay, everybody. So I would like to just open the floor one more time. Is there anyone else who had any questions that they want to ask? Any comments they want to make? While that's going on, I just want to give my thanks to Simon and Yana and Tanya and Letitia and Lorette. I hope I didn't finish, didn't forget anyone. If I did, let me know. Um, for taking the time and showcasing, showcasing that number one, this is global. Number two, we really are not alone. Um, and also number three, that there is significant voices to be heard at every stage of pregnancy in every situation. Mm -hmm. It is so unique. Mm -hmm. It is so different. Um, and I wish that there, that there was a manual like this. I wish there was a lived experience manual, not that things you should know before you have birth manual <laughs> with the stories of mothers and fathers and practitioners. Um, around this topic because it's been so enlightening and inspiring. So I would like to say thank you. And to all of our viewers that joined us as well, from my side anyway, thank you. And I'm going to hand over now, Claudia, did you want to say something also? I did, yes, thank you. Um, so firstly, now that you brought up Emmanuel, I think you guys kind of have to do it now. Um, you have enough people to do it, so um, we have you if you need to and want to. Um, but jokes aside, um, I just want to say on behalf of the network, thank you um, to all of our speakers and Keshni for moderating as well. Um, this was really, really amazing. And it was really nice to have a mix of some people that I already know versus my, my GMHPN family. And I've got new members and Keshni, um, you know, has just joined us and has come in with a force and wants to make these changes. And I I'm just thankful that you all joined her and joined us. Um, in, in this webinar. So thank you so much to all of you. Highly appreciate your experiences and the sharing of it and looking forward to um, anything you guys want to do going forward. We're here um, and we'll support you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So like we always say, from our hearts to yours, have an amazing evening. Um, keep the conversations going and please look out for more of these webinars. We're hoping to do more in this area. And we will be posting it. And if you have any lived experiences to share, please do let us know. Um, and we'd love to talk to you. So have a good evening, everybody. Good night.
Nice, thank you.